listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. RT reports, Terkeya's Erdogan concedes ruling party's electoral loss. The setback in municipal elections yesterday will be a turning point for the AKP, the president has vowed. For insight into this, let's turn to our next guest. Uh, he is he holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. One of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest books are entitled "I Dare Say: A Gerald Horn Reader" and "Acknowledging Radical Histories." Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So again, Erdogan has acknowledged the electoral defeat. The top offices in Turkey's largest cities were among those contested at the ballot box. The ruling party's main challenger, the Republican People's Party, has managed to retain the mayorships in Istanbul and Ankara. Uh, it's a problem for Erdogan, Dr. Horn. Oh, clearly it is. It's clearly a setback. And you can lay part of the problem at Mr. Erdogan's feet directly. Uh, he's been too clever by half, as they say in London. What I mean is that when he started in power a few decades ago, after serving a term as mayor of Istanbul, the central city in Turkey, his slogan was zero problems with neighbor, uh, which was highly enlightened. But as you look around the world and the neighborhood today, you see that the AKP has multiple problems with multiple neighbors. Let's start with Syria, just across the border, once close to Mr. Erdogan, speaking of President al-Assad in Damascus. But in recent years, the Turkey government uh, has been trying to destabilize uh, Mr. al-Assad's regime. It's shown a lack of flexibility with regard to dealing with the inflammatory Kurdish question, that is to say that there are Kurds on both sides of the border, and in terms of trying to suppress the Kurdish resistance altogether, it's led to multiple lances across the border by Ankara forces into its neighbor, which has weakened Syria tremendously, along with like-minded lances uh, administered by the NATO comrades, speaking of the United States of America, and then you see just today that Israel, taking advantage of a weakened Syria, has attacked in that country, killing a major commander from Iran, which threatens to spread the conflict between Israel and Hamas regionally, which Israel feels will then lead to a U.S. intervention on their side to pull their um, chestnuts out of the fire. You also see that Mr. Erdogan has been engaged in a kind of kabuki theater with regard to Zionism, posturing, uh, as they say in the streets, selling many whoop tickets, but not necessarily backing it up with actions, uh, all hat and no cattle, as the Texans like to say. So therefore, he's apparently close uh, to Hamas and close to the Muslim Brotherhood and close to Qatar, who, of course, he backed in their conflict with Saudi Arabia. Uh, but alas, uh, we have not seen the kind of muscular action to accompany the muscular rhetoric uh, with regard to Russia. We know that the relations between these two important powers have been complex over the centuries. They fought multiple wars against each other in the 19th century. Today, uh, Mr. Erdogan is playing a double game. That is to say, he is allowing his country to be a sieve through which goods can flow into Russia, helping to pump up its economy. But at the same time, his son-in-law is the head of a major military contractor that supplies drones to Ukraine, which has led to the death of all too many Russian soldiers. Uh, with regard to France, for example... There have been clashes between Mr. Erdogan and President Macron uh, that are escalating steadily. I know that you've just talked about Senegal, for example. That's part of the problem because Senegal, like a good deal of what used to be called uh, Francophone Africa, has a heavily Muslim population. 
And that's catnip for Mr. Erdogan. You can expect uh, Ankara to take advantage of the contradictions between the new regime in Dakar and the, the uh, French government, which is not going to be pleasing in Paris. We also see that uh, Mr. Erdogan has staked out a strong position in Somalia at the same time that U.S. drones are attacking Mogadishu on a regular basis. He staked out a strong position in Libya, taking advantage of the destabilization by NATO allies, France and the United States, and their killing of uh, Mr. Gaddafi more than a decade ago. And that brings us to NATO, which was behind the attack on Libya. Uh, Mr. Erdogan, once again, talked a good game with regard to blocking Swedish accession to NATO uh, because, of course, Sweden, like many European governments, has given exile and has housed many uh, Kurdish refugees. But alas, uh, he folded, which was quite typical. And with regard to the United States of America, uh, he has contradictions all over the place with the United States of America, not least is the fact that his major opposition Bigger. Speaking of Fatula Gulen, he is comfortably housed in the Poconos in eastern Pennsylvania, and Washington has refused multiple attempts to extradite him back to Ankara. Washington is also not pleased by the fact that whenever Mr. Erdogan comes to Washington, he makes a beeline to meet with black American Muslims, and obviously the agenda that they discuss is not necessarily a congruent with U.S. policies, at least that's what Washington thinks. And then we turn back to the 2016 attempted coup against Mr. Erdogan. It's well known that Washington was not upset by this attempted military coup. And despite massive purges carried out by Mr. Erdogan, uh, he still has an uncertain handle on the military, which sees itself as the guardian of secularism that was inaugurated more than a century ago by the founding father of modern Turkey, or Turkey, uh, speaking of Kemal Ataturk. Uh, Mr. Erdogan, despite protestations to the contrary, has tried to roll back secularism to a certain degree, which, of course, leads to his defeat at the polls just the other day uh, by the major secular opposition, which, of course, is heavily influenced uh, by a social uh, democratic uh, trend. And with regard to the European Union, despite uh, many promises and pledges, the EU has not extended an invitation uh, to Turkey to join their hollowed organization. Uh, this is not pleasing and awkward, needless to say. And in fact, despite the fact that there are numerous uh, Turkish workers helping to power the limping economy of the Federal Republic of Germany, the locomotive of the EU, there is not any budging uh, by the EU in terms of uh, extending an invitation for Turkey to join its ranks. And in fact, if you look at Brexit, uh, the British exit from the European Union just a few years ago, it was fueled in no small measure by hysteria about what would happen if 82 million strong Turkey were to join the ranks of the European Union. Uh, there was a lot of Islamophobia uh, involved in that kind of rhetoric. And so we see that Mr. Erdogan is in a very perilous position right now. Uh, this may just be the prelude to its ultimate downfall. Uh, we've got something interesting from a, uh, a, a, a GOP congressman by the name of Tim Wahlberg, who, interestingly enough, suggests that uh, the Gaza conflict should be handled, quote, like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But what's interesting is he goes on to talk about Ukraine and say both of them. My reasoning, and he says the reason is, I love this, the quicker these wars end, the fewer innocent lives will be caught in the crossfire. So you should go ahead and nuke Gaza, which I guess somehow the nuclear material will know not to fall on the rest of Israel, and nuke in Ukraine to save the people of Ukraine. I'm trying to make sense of something that makes no sense, Dr. Horn. Your thoughts on all of this? Well, the only surprise is that he did not let the cat out of the bag with regard to recent journalism suggesting that U.S. nuclear weapons have been stored and probably are still stored in Taiwan, the rebel province 
off the coast of China that China claims as its own, backed up by international law. We also know that about 10 miles off the coast of southern China, there have been disturbing reports about U.S. special forces there. We've had loose talk from the Pentagon leading generals about launching a war against China within the next 18 months. Inevitably, that would be a nuclear conflict. I think that the congressman, like others in his party, are softening up the U.S. populace for a nuclear holocaust. Uh, but alas, as your comment suggests, the, the nuclear fallout would inevitably drift across the Pacific and contaminate uh, California. And I should also say that uh, this is worrisome to U.S. allies. We know that Prime Minister Kashida is headed to the Oval Office uh, this week. We also know, uh, to accompany that, that Oppenheimer, the film about the so-called father of the nuclear bomb, uh, Mr. Oppenheimer, just opened. Uh, in uh, Japan, after being stalled, because obviously Japan is very sensitive about this question of the U.S. Uh, nuclear bomb. And we also know that what's happening right now is not only softening up the U.S. populace with regard to uh, a possible nuclear attack on Russia, uh, on Gaza, believe it or not, and of course on China, uh, but also it's a reflection of the fact that both wings of the ruling class, speaking of the Biden wing and the Trump wing, seem to be in the process of trying to not only uh, propagandize with regard to further conflict, but also trying to focus like a laser beam on China. Uh, that's the import of the recent news report that Mr. Zelensky has talked about negotiations with Russia based on the 2022 borders. He would not have made such a bold move without consultation uh, with the White House and the State Department. And I think that that is an indication of where we are right now, and where we are right now is not very good. Really quickly, as we get out, you mentioned in your discussion about Turkey that Israel has an interest in attacking Syria, uh, hopefully to uh, escalate the conflict to the point where the United States has to enter in the fray in order to pull its chestnuts out of the fire. Is part of Israel's thinking also that they want, they're trying to bait Iran into the conflict as well? Oh, clearly so. And once again, I think that that's going against the imperial strategy of both wings of the ruling class, the Biden wing and the Trump wing, which realizes that with strained resources, they can barely afford to focus on China. And yet we also see that the Biden wing is trying to moonwalk away in its own inevitable fashion from Israel. That's the import of the flap with Mr. Netanyahu, the attempt to replace him with Benny Gantz, a member of his war party. Uh, I don't think that Mr. Netanyahu is going to be in office uh, much longer. And if that's the case, uh, that will be the kind of cosmetic change that the Biden administration thinks it needs in order to satisfy the increasingly militant uh, anti-war wing of its party, uh, speaking of the youth that have been disrupting his fundraisers, speaking of the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the Black Church, which has come out for a ceasefire, the UAW, United Auto Workers, come out for a ceasefire. Mr. Biden has problems, and Mr. Netanyahu is not the thing. And this is the, the, the final point. When you start talking about Benny Gantz replacing Netanyahu, you're talking about going further right than Netanyahu, if that is even <laughs> possible in the, in, the, in the parameters of physics. Well, as noted, it's just a cosmetic change it's mm -hmm. meant to throw dust in the eyes of Mr. Biden's increasingly arrested party. But like many of his other gambits, I think this one will not work either. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Look forward to having you back. Thank you.